Hello and welcome to Lucid Mind Chemistry channel with Majid. In this video, I'll be solving Chemistry O Levels Multiple Choice, paper 12 from October November 2018. You can go to any particular question by following timestamps given in the video description. Let's start. Question 1 When heated magnesium reacts with oxygen in the air to form magnesium oxide a white powder. A student investigates the change in mass that occurs during this reaction. He is given a balance and three sets of apparatus as shown. In the first one we have metal tongs and this is burning magnesium. In second we have glass tube in which magnesium is present and air flows in and out of the apparatus. In third one we have crucible in which magnesium is present and we also have metal tongs and heat. Which sets of apparatus are suitable for this investigation? As in this question, we have to find the change in mass. So therefore, in first one, we can see that as magnesium is burnt in the presence of oxygen, it forms magnesium oxide that is in powder form. So when it becomes powder, the mass will be lost. So the exact mass cannot be measured. So this is incorrect. In the second experiment, we can see that magnesium metal is present in the tube. When it is heated in the presence of air or oxygen, it forms magnesium oxide and its mass can be measured after heating. So therefore, apparatus 2 seems to be correct option. In the third one, we have magnesium metal that is present in the crucible. When it is heated, it forms magnesium oxide powder. The powder is still present in this crucible. So therefore, we can measure the change in mass that occurs during this reaction. No mass is lost as it is closed. So therefore, third apparatus also seems to be correct as second and third are correct so therefore answer is c question two four substances are heated gently the temperatures at which they start and finish melting are recorded these are the substances and this is the starting temperature and this is the finishing temperature which statement about the substances is correct a substance one is the only pure substance let's find out which is the pure substance among these four as we know that the pure substance always has fixed melting point or fixed boiling point in first one we can see that the substance starts to melt at 117 and it finishes melting at 117 so as the melting point is fixed, so therefore this is pure substance. Second one starts to melt at 0 degrees and finishes melting at 0 degrees. Again, this is pure substance as melting point is fixed and during melting the temperature does not change. In the third one, we have a range of temperature. It starts to melt at 36 and finishes melting at 40. So as we have a range of temperatures, similarly in fourth one, we have four degrees centigrade change in temperature during melting. So therefore substance three and substance four is not pure. They are impure substances. So statement A, substance one is the only pure substance. This is wrong because substance two is also a pure substance. Part B, substance three and substance four are impure. This is true because we have range of melting point in three and four. So therefore this is correct. C substance 4 is water. Now for water the melting point is 0 degree centigrade while they have given 101. So therefore C is incorrect. D they are all solids at room temperature. Now we can see that substance 2 has 0 degree centigrade as melting point. So therefore it is not solid at room temperature. It must be liquid. While all other three are solids at room temperature because their melting point is above room temperature. So D is incorrect. Correct answer is therefore B. Question 3. A substance dissolves in water to form a colorless solution. This solution reacts with aqueous silver nitrate in the presence of dilute nitric acid to give a yellow precipitate. What is possible identity of the substance? First thing is that the substance dissolves in water. It means it is soluble. Now all these salts are soluble. Calcium iodide, copper chloride, iron iodide and sodium chloride.
but we can see that copper 2 chloride and iron 2 iodide as copper 2 and iron 2 are members of transition elements so therefore they will form colored solution instead of colorless so B and C are incorrect. Then we have calcium iodide and sodium chloride. Now in the presence of silver nitrate, calcium iodide, it can react to form silver iodide and calcium nitrate. Now silver iodide is yellow precipitate. So therefore A could be the correct option. With sodium chloride, we can see that it will form a precipitate of silver chloride along with sodium nitrate. Now silver chloride is white precipitate so therefore D is incorrect. Correct answer is A. Question 4. Which statements are correct? Number 1. The volume of gas at constant pressure increases as the temperature increases. This is true statement because when temperature is increased, the kinetic energy is also increased so therefore volume of gas increases. 2. The rate of diffusion of gas increases as the temperature increases. Again, this is a correct statement because diffusion is also proportional to temperature. This is because at higher temperature, kinetic energy of molecules is higher. So therefore, the collisions in molecules will be higher and diffusion will be faster. 3. The pressure of gas at constant volume decreases as the temperature increases. This is incorrect because temperature is directly proportional to pressure. When temperature is increased, kinetic energy increases, the pressure of gas also increases. As 1 and 2 is correct, so therefore answer is B. Question 5. Which particle contains the greatest number of electrons? We have magnesium, nitrogen, neon and sulfur. From periodic table we can find out the atomic number. For magnesium the atomic number is 12. For nitrogen the atomic number is 7. Similarly for neon the atomic number is given as 10 and for sulfur it is 16. Now atomic number is the number of protons and number of protons is equal to the number of electrons in neutral atom. So as we have plus 2 charge, it means 2 electrons are lost. So therefore 12 minus 2 will be 10 electrons. So in magnesium plus 2, we have 10 electrons. In nitrogen, we had 7 electrons in neutral while we have negative 3 charge. So it means 3 electrons are added in neutral atom of nitrogen. So 7 plus 3 becomes 10 electrons. In neon, the atomic number is 10. As the charge is 0, so therefore number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. So again we have 10 electrons present. In sulfur we had 16 atomic numbers, so there was 16 electrons present in neutral sulfur. While we have negative 2 charge, so it means 2 electrons are added. So 16 plus 2 becomes 18 electrons. So we can see that in sulfur we have maximum number of electrons, so therefore answer is D. Question 6. Which substance has a giant covalent structure at room temperature? A. We have methane. Methane is CH4 and it is a gas at room temperature because it has simple molecular structure. So A is incorrect. B is sand. Sand is SiO2. The structure of sand is such that one silicon bonds to four oxygen atoms. And each oxygen atom binds itself with two silicon. Then again one silicon is bonded to four oxygen atoms. And this structure continues. Silicon dioxide is also solid at room temperature and the structure is giant covalent. So this could be the correct option. C. We have sodium chloride. In sodium chloride we have sodium ions and chloride ions present. Each sodium 
ion is surrounded by chloride ions and each chloride ion is again surrounded by sodium ions so the structure is giant ionic as ionic bonding is present so therefore this is not covalent d is water water is not a solid at room temperature because the formula is h2o and it is simple molecular it is not giant covalent so d is incorrect correct answer is b Question 7. One atom of an element X and two atoms of an element Y react to form an ionic compound. Element X forms a positive ion. Which elements could be X and Y? Now, ionic compound is always formed between metals and non-metals. As in the question, it says that element X forms a positive ion. So therefore, we know that metal always forms positive ion while non-metal forms negative ion. So element X is a metal so and element Y should be a non-metal. Now it says that one atom of element X forms a compound with two atoms of element Y. So the formula is X, Y, 2. Let's find out which one forms this formula. First, we have calcium. And then we have sodium, calcium is plus 2. As it is in second group of the periodic table, it will lose 2 electrons. Sodium is in first group, so it will lose just 1 electron and form sodium plus 1. Similarly, chlorine is in group 7 of the periodic table, so it will gain just 1 electron to form chloride ion in order to complete its octet. Similarly, oxygen is in group 6 of the periodic table, so it needs 2 electrons to complete its octet. So oxygen will form negative. Now first one is calcium with chlorine as we have plus 2 charge on calcium and negative 1 charge on chlorine. So when making a compound what happens that the charges become number of atoms. So there will be 2 chlorine atoms and 1 calcium atom to form CaCl2. This is in accordance with the formula given in the question x, y, 2 as this is x and this is y. So therefore option A seems to be correct. In second one, we have calcium and oxygen. Now, as the charges are equal and opposite, so therefore they will be cancelled out. We have calcium plus 2, oxygen negative 2. So similar charges are cancelled out and the rest becomes the compound. So we have CaO. So B is incorrect. Part C, sodium and chlorine. Now sodium is plus 1 and chlorine is negative 1. So as the charges are equal and opposite, they will be cancelled out. So the formula that is formed is NaCl. Again, this is incorrect. Now, last one is sodium with oxygen. Sodium is plus 1, oxygen is negative 2. So now 2 will come over here, 1 will go over there. So it will form Na2O. Again, it is the reverse of XY2. So therefore, D is also incorrect. Correct answer is therefore A. Question 8. An element with a high melting point forms an oxide that is gaseous at room temperature. Which type of structure or bonding is present in the element? Now, oxides of metals are always solid, while oxides of some non-metals are gaseous. For example, we have carbon, which is a non-metal, and when it reacts with oxygen, it will form CO2 and CO2 is gas. Now it says which type of structure or bonding is present in this element. We have carbon, so carbon is either in the form of graphite or diamond. In both graphite and diamond, we have giant covalent structure. It is not ionic, neither metallic nor simple molecular. Because we have extensive number of covalent bonds in graphite and in diamond, in graphite each carbon atoms makes three single covalent bonds with other carbon atoms. 
while in diamond one carbon atoms makes four single covalent bonds with other four carbon atoms and the structure continues correct answer is therefore a Question 9 which statement explains why aluminum is malleable. Now malleable means that it can be formed into sheets and different shapes. This is because of the sliding of atoms on each other. We have A. Aluminum has layers of cations that can slide over one another. Now as aluminum is a metal and in metal cations layers are present along with the layers of C of electrons. And due to the sliding of these cations over each other, the metal is always malleable. So this statement seems to be correct. Part B, aluminum has layers of electrons that can slide over one another. Now malleability is due to the sliding of cations, not the sliding of electrons. So therefore statement B is wrong. Part C, aluminum has weak bonds between protons and C of electrons as aluminum is a metal and in metal strong bond is present which is called metallic bond so therefore statement c is wrong d aluminum is covered with a layer of unreactive aluminum oxide this is a true statement because aluminum reacts with oxygen to form unreactive aluminum oxide layer but this statement does not explain the malleability of aluminum so therefore it is incorrect correct answer is therefore a Question 10. The incomplete equation for the reaction between ethane, we have C2H2 and oxygen is shown. C2H2 reacts with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. When the equation is balanced, what is the correct value for oxygen gas? Let's balance this equation. They have given two moles of C2H2, so we can find the number of carbon atoms. So 2 into 2, it is 4 carbon atoms on the reactant side. So we can balance by writing 4 with the product. Now carbons are balanced. Next thing is hydrogen. As we can see we have two moles of C2H2 so therefore there are four atoms of hydrogen present on the rectant side. So we can make this four by multiplying it with two. So we have two water, four carbon dioxide. Now we can balance the number of oxygen atoms. As we have four into two, eight oxygen in CO2 and two oxygen atoms in water. So in total we have 10 oxygen atoms on the product side. As on the rectant side we do not have any oxygen in this compound so we can make this 10 by writing 5 with O2. So correct option is D. Question 11. A compound contains 40% carbon, 6.7% hydrogen and 53.3% oxygen by mass. The relative molecular mass of the compound is between 55 and 65. What is the molecular formula of the compound? They have given the percentage composition of each element present in the compound so we can find the empirical formula. And by using molecular formula between 55 and 65 we can find the molecular formula of the compound. Let's first find the molecular masses of all these four. We have CH2O as we have one carbon, so it is 12. Two hydrogen atoms, so one into two. One oxygen atom, so it is 16. Now the total molecular mass becomes 30. In second one, we have two carbon atoms. So for one carbon, we had 12. For two, we, it will be 24. Plus for one hydrogen, it is one. So for four hydrogen, it will be four. For one oxygen, it is 16. Now the molecular mass comes equal to 44. As both of them are less than 55, so therefore A and B is incorrect. In C, we have two carbon atoms, so it is 24 for carbons, 4 for 4 hydrogens, and we have two oxygen atoms, so 16 into 2 becomes 32. 36, 40 is 50, 60. Again, two carbon atoms, 24 plus 6 hydrogens plus 2 oxygen so it is equal to 62 so either it is c or it is d let's find the empirical formula from percentage we have carbon 
हाइड्रोजन ऑक्सीजन परसेंटेज इज गिवन एज फोर्टी सिक्स पॉइंट सेवन फिफ्टी थ्री पॉइंट थ्री we can use percentage as mass in grams in the next step we have to find the number of moles as moles is equal to mass in grams divided by atomic mass so mass in grams is 40 atomic mass of carbon is 12 mass in grams of hydrogen is 6.7 atomic mass of one hydrogen atom is 1 similarly for oxygen it is 53.3 divided by one atom of oxygen which is 16 now the values come equal to 3.33 for carbon 6.7 for hydrogen and again 3.33 for oxygen now we can simplify these by dividing with the least value we have 3.3 as the smallest value so we can divide it with all three so the ratio comes equal to 1 to 1 so we have one carbon atom two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom in the empirical formula Let's find the molecular mass of this empirical formula. So we have one carbon, which is twelve, two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom. So it is equal to thirty. Now we can find the value of n as n is equal to the molecular mass or the molecular formula mass of compound divided by empirical formula mass of the empirical formula of that compound. Let's find it. First one is sixty, so sixty divided by thirty, n is equal to two. While if we use this value, then n does not come equal to a whole number; it will come in point. The point is that n must always be a whole number, so it is sixty. So we are going to use sixty instead of sixty-two. now we can find the molecular formula molecular formula is equal to n multiplied by empirical formula as this was the empirical formula and n is equal to 2 so 2 into ch2o it will become c2h4o2 So again we can see that this comes equal to C correct answer is therefore C Question 12 what is observed during the electrolysis of aqueous copper 2 sulfate using carbon electrodes in aqueous copper 2 sulfate we have copper plus 2 Sulfate negative two. We also have H plus ions and OH negative ions because of the presence of water. Part A: A pink solid is deposited on the anode. Now anode is positive electrode and anions move towards anode. Among these anions, OH negative is discharged into oxygen, so therefore no pink solid is deposited. B: Bubbles form on the negative electrode. Now cations move towards negative electrode and among these cations copper plus 2 will be discharged to copper solid so no bubbles are formed on the negative electrode this is because copper is more easily discharged as compared to h plus so copper solid is formed instead of hydrogen gas part c the color of solution fades now in solution we had the color because of the presence of copper plus 2 now as copper plus 2 is moving towards cathode and it is getting discharged so as the concentration decreases the color also starts to fade part d the negative electrode becomes smaller this is incorrect statement because electrode is not getting dissolved correct answer is therefore c Question thirteen: Four processes using electrolysis are listed. First one is the electrolysis of concentrated aqueous sodium chloride. Second is the electrolysis of dilute sulfuric acid. Third is the extraction of aluminum from aluminum oxide. 
Fourth is the purification of copper using aqueous copper to sulfate, which processes produce oxygen at one of the electrodes. Let's find the reaction in each one of these. First one is the electrolysis of concentrated aqueous sodium chloride. Now in concentrated sodium chloride, we have Na positive, Cl negative, and as we have water, so we have H positive and OH negative. Now among the cations, we have Na plus and H plus. H plus is easily discharged as compared to Na plus. So what will happen that H plus is going to be converted into hydrogen gas. This will happen at cathode, negative electrode. Now at positive electrode, Cl negative will be discharged as compared to OH negative because the concentration of Cl negative is very high as compared to OH negative as it is concentrated solution. So Cl negative will be discharged. Anion goes towards anode, it will lose its electron to form chlorine gas. So at cathode, hydrogen gas is formed, while at anode, chlorine gas is formed. No oxygen gas is produced, so therefore one is incorrect. In second one, we have electrolysis of dilute sulfuric acid. Now in sulfuric acid, we have H positive ions, sulfate negative ions. And as it is dilute, so we have water. In water, H plus is present and also OH negative is present. Now among the cations, we have H plus on both sides. So therefore, H plus will be converted into hydrogen gas. Cation will move towards cathode. It will gain electron and form gas. On second electrode, we have these negative ions. And as we know that sulfate ion is not discharged, so OH negative ions will be discharged. Negative ions will move towards anode and they will lose electrons to form oxygen, water and electrons. So on cathode hydrogen gas is formed while at anode oxygen gas is produced. So as oxygen is present at one of the electrodes, so option 2 is correct. Part 3 extraction of aluminum from pure aluminum oxide. Now aluminum oxide is in molten form. And the ions formed will be Al plus 3 and O negative 2. Now cations will move towards cathode. It will gain electrons to form metal. And anion moves towards anode. It will lose electrons at anode to form oxygen gas. As oxygen is formed at one of the electrodes, so therefore option 3 is also correct. In the fourth one, we have purification of copper using aqueous copper to sulfate. Now in purification, what happens that at anode, this is anode. And this is cathode. Impure copper is present at anode, while pure copper is present at cathode. The solution is of copper sulfate. Now what happens is that this impure copper first converts into copper ions by dissolving. And these copper plus 2 ions will move towards this to form copper solid. As no oxygen is being produced, so therefore 4 is incorrect. Correct answer is therefore B. Question 14, which statements about endothermic reactions are correct? Now, endothermic reactions are those reactions in which energy is absorbed from the surroundings. Number one, energy is absorbed from the surroundings. This is a true statement. Number two, energy is released to the surroundings. This happens in exothermic reaction, not in endothermic reactions. Three, the temperature of the reaction mixture falls. This is 
correct because in endothermic reactions the temperature shows decrease in the reading for example if initial temperature was 20 degree centigrade then in endothermic reaction it will decrease to let's say 10 degree centigrade or anything else that is lower than 20. For the temperature of the reaction mixture rises this is only true for exothermic reactions not for endothermic. So statement 1 and 3 are correct answer is A. Question 15. A fuel is completely burned in air. Carbon dioxide, water and heat are produced. Which energy profile diagram is correct for burning a fuel? As the combustion of fuel is exothermic reaction and heat is produced. So for exothermic reaction you must always remember that the energy of product is less than the energy of the reactants. This is because rest of the energy is released in the form of heat. So in A we can see that the product is at lower energy as compared to reactant. So it could be A. In B we can see that the product is at higher energy as compared to the reactant. So this is for endothermic reaction not exothermic reaction. Similarly in part C we can see that the product is at lower energy as compared to the reactant. So this is for exothermic. While in D it is at higher energy. So D is also incorrect. Now among A and C we can see that in A there is no activation energy involved while in C we have activation energy which results in the formation of product. Now in a chemical reaction activation energy is always must. A chemical reaction cannot take place without activation energy. In case of combustion activation energy is the flame that is used to start the combustion process so therefore answer is C. Question 16. The equation shows the reaction for the manufacture of ammonia. We have nitrogen gas that reacts with hydrogen gas to form ammonia gas. Which change will decrease the activation energy for the reaction? Now you must remember that activation energy is always decreased by the use of catalyst. It is not decreased by anything else. So addition of catalyst is correct option. Answer is A. Question 17. Solid ammonium chloride is heated. The gases ammonia and hydrogen chloride are formed. This is reaction 1. Ammonia gas is mixed with hydrogen chloride gas. Solid ammonium chloride is formed. This is the reverse of first reaction. This is reaction 2. Which statement is correct? We can write the chemical reaction. First one is solid ammonium chloride NH4Cl. It is heated. It forms ammonia and HCl. In second one we have ammonia and HCl. They are both mixed together and they form NH4Cl. Part A both reaction 1 and reaction 2 are exothermic. As we can see that reaction 1 requires heat so therefore this is endothermic in nature not exothermic. Part B reaction 2 is reversible. Now this is a true statement because ammonium chloride can be heated to form ammonia and HCl so therefore this reaction can occur in both forward and backward reactions so therefore this is a reversible reaction. Part C the equation for reaction 1 is NH5Cl forms NH4 and HCl. This is incorrect because the formula is NH4Cl not NH5Cl. Part D, the three substances involved in each reaction all have a simple molecular structure. Now we have ammonia. Ammonia is NH3. We have covalent bonding and simple molecular structure is present. Second one is HCl. We have covalent bonding. Simple molecular structure is present. Then we have NH4Cl. In NH4Cl, NH4 is positive. Cl is negative. So therefore ionic bonding is also present.
so the structure is not simple molecular this is ionic bonding so the structure is lattice structure so simple molecular structure is only correct for these two not for this one so therefore d is wrong correct answer is therefore b Question 18. In a closed flask, gases Q and R reach a dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium means that the rate of forward reaction is equal to the rate of backward reaction. Enthalpy change is positive. Which change will move the equilibrium to the right? Right means in the forward direction or in the positive enthalpy change. Now as delta H is positive, it means it is endothermic in forward direction. and it will be exothermic in backward direction. First one is adding a catalyst. Catalyst increases the speed of reaction in both forward and backward direction. So therefore equilibrium will not be shifted to the right. It will stay in its own place. Part B is decreasing the temperature. For endothermic reaction, it, if you increase the temperature, the reaction will move in the forward direction. If you decrease the temperature, the reaction will move in the backward direction. So therefore, the equilibrium will move to the left. So this is incorrect. Part C, increasing the pressure. Now pressure depends on the number of moles of gases as we have one mole on the reactant side and two moles on the product side. So if we increase the pressure, the equilibrium shifts from more number of moles to less number of moles. So it is from R to Q. So it will go in the backward direction. So again, C is incorrect. Part D, increasing the volume of the flask. Now volume is inversely proportional to the pressure. If volume is increased, it means pressure decreases. So when pressure is decreased, the reaction will move from less number of moles to more number of moles. So therefore, it, the equilibrium will shift to the right. Correct answer is therefore D. Question 19, which reaction is a redox reaction? A redox means in which both reduction and oxidation take place at the same time. Let's find the oxidation states. Magnesium is in metal form, so therefore oxidation state is zero. Hydrogen is in molecular form, so the oxidation state is zero. In HCl, hydrogen is plus one, Cl is minus one. In magnesium chloride, as magnesium is from group two of the periodic table, so it is plus two and 1 Cl is minus 1. As we can see that magnesium has shifted from 0 to plus 2 which is oxidation and hydrogen has shifted from plus 1 back to 0 which is reduction. So as both oxidation and reduction are taking place in A so therefore A could be the correct answer. In part B, we have magnesium carbonate. Now magnesium is plus 2 in compound form. Again, we have magnesium chloride. So it is plus 2 in compound form. There is no change in oxidation state of magnesium. Similarly, hydrogen is plus 1 in HCl. And it is plus 1 in water. Oxygen is negative 2 in carbonate, negative 2 in CO2. So as we can see that no change in oxidation state has taken place. So therefore, this is not a redox reaction. Similarly, in part C, magnesium is making a compound. So it is plus 2. Again, plus 2. No change has taken place. Oxygen is negative 2. Negative 2. Hydrogen is plus 1. Plus 1. Similarly, chlorine is negative 1. Negative 1. So this is not a redox reaction. Part D, again magnesium is making a compound, so it is plus 2. Plus 2 on the product side, no change. Plus 1 for hydrogen, plus 1 for hydrogen in water. Minus 1 for chlorine, minus 1 for chlorine. So no change has taken place, so therefore this is also not redox reaction. Correct answer is A.
Question 23. Separate mixtures of solution and solid are made as shown in the table. The mixtures are warmed. In which mixture does gas form? First is the reaction of sodium hydroxide aqueous with ammonium salt. Now we know that when ammonium salt is reacted with alkali, it forms ammonia gas along with salt and water. The reaction would be like this. The product is salt, which is sodium chloride, water, along with the production of ammonia gas. So A and B could be correct. Then we have second reaction in which sulfuric acid reacts with ammonium chloride salt. Now ammonium chloride salt only produces gas with alkali, it does not react with acid. In third one, we can see that sulfuric acid aqueous reacts with magnesium solid. Now magnesium is a metal and metal reacts with acid to form salt and hydrogen. The salt formed would be magnesium sulfate along with hydrogen gas. Correct answer is B. Question 21. The carbonate, chloride and sulfate of a metal are all soluble in water. What is the metal? Now you should remember that all sodium salts, all potassium salts, all ammonium salts are always soluble in water. So as we have carbonate, chloride and sulfate, so the carbonate, chloride and sulfate of potassium are always soluble. For barium, we know that barium sulfate is insoluble. For calcium, calcium carbonate is insoluble. For silver, silver chloride is insoluble. Correct answer is therefore C. Question 22. Which fertilizer contains the highest percentage of nitrogen by mass? Formula of percentage by mass is as we have nitrogen, so percentage by mass of nitrogen is equal to the atomic mass of nitrogen, which is 14 according to periodic table, multiplied by number of atoms of nitrogen present in the compound. divided by the molecular mass of compound which is given multiply by 100 let's calculate for each of these for first one we have two atoms of nitrogen so as atomic mass is 14 so percentage of nitrogen is equal to 14 into 2 divided by the MR of this compound which is 80 into 100 so it comes equal to 35 percent similarly for second one we have ammonium phosphate we can see that there are three nitrogen atoms present so it will be 14 into 3 divided by the formula mass of this compound which is 149 into 100 it is equal to 28 percent similarly for C we have ammonium sulfate as we have two nitrogen atoms the formula mass is given as 132 so it is equal to 21.2 percent in the last one, we have potassium nitrate. We only have one nitrogen atom. So therefore, it will be 14 into 1 divided by the formula mass, which is 101 into 100. It is equal to 13.86%. 
as we can see that among these highest percentage of nitrogen is present in first one so therefore it is a Question 23, which set of conditions is used in the contact process? Now, a contact process is used for the manufacture of sulfuric acid, H2SO4. The conditions are that we have temperature, which is 450 degrees centigrade. The pressure is always one atmosphere. And the catalyst uses vanadium pentaoxide or V2O5. As we can see that all three options are correct in part D. So therefore, D is the correct option. Question 24, the diagram shows part of the periodic table. We have W which is present in second group. We have X that is present in transition elements. Then we have Y and Z in group 6 and 7 respectively. Which two letters represent the elements that can react together to form covalent compounds? Now you should always remember that covalent compound is always formed between non-metals. W is in group 2 of the periodic table, so it is a metal. X is in transition elements, so it is also a metal. Y is in group 6 of the periodic table, so it is non-metal. Z is in group 7 of the periodic table, so it is also a non-metal. So therefore, covalent bond can be formed between Y and Z. Answer is therefore D. Question 25, the group 1 metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, show trends in their melting points and in their reactions with water. Which statement is correct going down the group from lithium to potassium? In moving down in group 1, we have lithium, then sodium, then potassium. Now first one is the melting point. As we can see that the size of atom increases because in each period a new shell is added. So therefore... The size of potassium is very large as compared to sodium which is larger as compared to lithium. As the size of metal increases, so therefore its melting point decreases. This is because the attraction between the nucleus and outer electrons become less. Second thing is the reaction with water. Now as down the group, the outermost electrons is easy to lose as its attraction to the nucleus becomes less. So therefore, their activity will increase. Part A, their melting point decrease. This is true. And their reaction with water becomes less vigorous. This is incorrect because their activity increases. So the reaction becomes more vigorous with water. Part B, melting point decreases. And their action with water becomes more vigorous. This seems to be true. Part C, their melting point increase. This is wrong. In D, again it says increase. So this is incorrect. Correct answer is therefore B. Question 26. From their position in the periodic table, which properties do you expect the elements vanadium, chromium and cobalt to have? Vanadium, chromium and cobalt, all three are members of transition elements and transition elements have variable oxidation states. They also form colored compounds and they have high melting point. Correct answer is A. Question 27. The diagram shows the structure of an alloy. Which statement about alloys is correct? A. Alloys can only be formed by mixing copper or iron with other metals. This is not true because any metal can be used to make an alloy with other metal. 
B. High carbon steel alloys are soft. This is incorrect because they are hard and they cannot be easily shaped. C. In an alloy, there is attraction between positive ions and C of electrons. This is true because alloys are made up of metals and in metals there is a force of attraction between positive metal ions and C of electrons that are surrounding those ions. D. The alloy brass has a chemical formula. This is incorrect because alloys are always physical combinations. They are mixtures that do not have any chemical formula. Correct answer is therefore C. Question 28. Which pair of reagents will undergo a displacement reaction? We have silver and copper sulfate, we have copper and magnesium sulfate, magnesium and calcium sulfate, zinc and copper sulfate. Now among these, you should always remember that more reactive metal can displace less reactive metal, while less reactive metal cannot displace more reactive metal. So first we must write the reactivity series. We have potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminum, zinc, iron, lead, copper, silver. First one is silver with copper sulfate. As we can see that silver is below copper. So therefore silver cannot displace copper from copper sulfate. In part B, we have copper and magnesium sulfate. Now copper is below in reactivity as compared to magnesium. So therefore copper cannot displace magnesium from magnesium sulfate. So this reaction will not occur. Part C, magnesium will react with calcium sulfate. Now magnesium is below in reactivity as compared to calcium. So therefore magnesium cannot displace calcium from calcium sulfate. In last one, we have zinc and copper sulfate. Now we can see that zinc is above copper so therefore zinc can displace copper from copper sulfate and the reaction will be zinc sulfate plus copper so part d seems to be correct answer is d Question 29. The reactivity series for some metals with two gaps labeled X and Y is shown. These are the most reactive ones and these are the less reactive ones. Which row correctly identifies metal X and Y and the method of extraction of Y from its O? From reactivity series, we have potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, then we have aluminum, then zinc, then iron then lead, hydrogen, copper and silver. So metal X is aluminum and metal Y is iron. Second is the method of extraction of Y. You should remember that aluminum and the metals above it are always extracted using electrolysis. As they are more reactive metals, while the less reactive metals can be done by reduction with carbon. So as Y is below aluminum, so therefore Y can be reduced with carbon. Electrolysis is not necessary for Y. Correct answer is therefore B. Question 30. Iron can be extracted from the O hematite, which is iron oxide, Fe2O3. What is the maximum mass of iron that could be produced from 500 kilograms of hematite? Atomic mass is given. For oxygen, it is 16. For iron, it is 56. And all the answers are given in kilograms. For the sake of simplification, we can use grams instead of kilograms for the question and grams instead of kilograms for the answer. It says iron can be extracted from this O, so we can write the balanced equation. We have Fe2O3. It forms iron and oxygen. 
Let's balance this equation. We have two atoms of iron on the right hand side, so we can write two with Fe. We have three oxygen atoms on the right hand side and two on the product side, so we can write three by two. Two will be cancelled out with two and it will form three atoms of oxygen. Now in balanced equation, we have one mole of iron oxide that forms two moles of iron. In the question, they have given the mass of Fe2O3, which is hematite. So we can first convert this mass into number of moles. Formula is moles is equal to mass in grams divided by molecular mass. Mass in grams is given, it is 500 grams. MR of Fe2O3 can be found out using these atomic masses. Iron is 56. As we have two atoms of iron, so it is 2 into 56. Oxygen is 16. As we have three atoms of oxygen, so it is 3 into 16. The molecular mass of Fe2O3 comes equal to 160. So the number of moles in 500 grams will be 3.125 moles. From the balanced equation, we know that one mole of hematite produces two moles of iron. So therefore, 3.125 moles of hematite will produce x moles of iron. By cross multiplying, we can find the moles of iron that are produced from these number of moles. So x equals 2 into 3.125. So it is equal to 6.25 moles of iron. But they are asking about the mass of iron, not the moles. So we can convert these moles into the mass of iron. The formula is mass in grams is equal to number of moles into atomic mass. Number of moles is 6.25. Atomic mass of Fe is given, it is 56. So mass in grams come equal to 350 grams. Correct answer is therefore C. Question 31. Aluminum is used to make saucepans because of its apparent lack of reactivity. Which property of aluminum explains its unreactivity? A. It has a layer of oxide on its surface. This is true because aluminum forms oxide layer which is insoluble and it makes aluminum unreactive. B. It has low density. This is a true statement but it does not have anything to do with reactivity. C. It is a good conductor of electricity. This is also a true statement, but again, it does not define unreactivity of aluminum. D. It is in group 3 of the periodic table. This is also a true statement, but it does not define unreactivity. Correct answer is therefore A. Question 32. Pollutant gases are released by the bacterial decay of vegetable matter. The bacterial decay of vegetable matter is the main source of which gas? Now decaying of vegetable matter always produces methane which is CH4. Correct answer is therefore B. Question 33. Several different treatments are used to purify the water supply. Which impurities can be removed by which treatment? First one is filtration, then we have use of carbon and then third one is chlorination. Now filtration cannot remove microbes because they are very small in size. Filtration can be used to remove insoluble solids. Now carbon can be used to remove odors and tastes. It cannot be used to remove microbes or solids. In third one, chlorination can only remove microbes. It cannot remove other substances. So therefore, correct answer is D.
Question 34, which statement about the homologous series of alkanes is correct? In homologous series of alkanes, we have methane, CH4, then we have ethane, C2H6, then propane, C3H8, then butane, and so on. It says alkanes are unsaturated hydrocarbons. In alkanes, there is always single carbon-carbon bond. So therefore, they are not unsaturated, they are saturated hydrocarbons. In part B, it says alkanes all have the general formula CnH2n. Now we can see that the general formula is CnH2n plus 2. This is incorrect. Part C, the boiling point decreases as the number of carbon atoms per molecule increases. When the number of carbon atom increase, the number of hydrogen atoms also increase and melting point and boiling point also increases. This is because intramolecular forces of attraction develop in larger molecules. Part D, the liquid alkanes become more viscous as the mass of molecule increases. Now as the mass increases, the intramolecular force will also increase and the viscosity will also increase. This is true statement. Correct answer is therefore D. Question 35. Which compound has the empirical formula with the greatest relative formula mass? Let's first find the empirical formula for all these. Empirical formula shows the simple ratio of atoms as we have 2 carbon and 6 hydrogen. So we can simplify it as 1 ratio 3. So it will become CH3. Similarly, between 4 and 10, we can simplify with 2. So it will become C2H5. For part C, we have 5 and 10, so 5 1s are 5, 5 2s are 10, the simple ratio is CH2. In part D, we have equal number of atoms, so it can be simplified C1H1. Now, as we can see that among these four, two carbon atoms are present in this one, five hydrogen atoms are also present. So the molecular mass or the relative formula mass should be the highest in B. It is 12 into 2 for carbons and 1 into 5 for hydrogen so it is equal to 29 in others we have just one carbon atom so therefore molecular masses will be less answer is b Question 36, which statement about vegetable oil and margarine made from it is correct? A, both are liquids at room temperature. This is incorrect because vegetable oil is liquid while margarine is solid. Part B, both occur naturally. This is again incorrect because vegetable oil occurs naturally while margarine is synthetic in nature. It is made from vegetable oil by hydrogenation process. Part C, margarine has the higher melting point as it is in solid form, so therefore the melting point will be higher as compared to vegetable oil. Part D, vegetable oil has fewer carbon-carbon double bonds than margarine. Now in vegetable oil, carbon-carbon double bonds are present, which are converted into carbon-carbon single bonds upon hydrogenation to convert it into margarine. So number of double bonds in oil is greater as compared to the number of double bonds in margarine. So this is incorrect. Correct answer is C. Question 37. When ethene reacts with steam to form ethanol, which type of reaction takes place? The formula of ethene is C2H4. It is alkene with carbon-carbon double bonds present. Steam is water in gaseous forms. Ethanol is C2H5OH. We can write the equation. We have ethene, two carbon atoms, four hydrogen atoms are present. Then we have steam or H2O. 
Now what will happen that this hydrogen atom is attached to one of the carbon atom, OH is attached to another carbon atom and double bond is converted into single covalent bond. So the product will be like this, we have carbon, it already has two hydrogen atoms. One more hydrogen is added, so now there are three hydrogen atoms. Similarly on this carbon atom, we had two hydrogen atoms. Now OH is also added and double bond has converted into single bond. As we can see that addition of HOH has taken place or steam has taken place so therefore this is addition reaction. No other product is formed. It is not fermentation because in fermentation glucose converts into ethanol. It is not polymerization because in polymerization ethene converts into polyethene polymer. It is not reduction as we can say that oxygen is added so alkene is converted into alcohol. Correct answer is A. Question 38. An ester is formed from carboxylic acid and an alcohol. How does the number of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen atoms in an ester differ from the total number of these atoms in carboxylic acid and alcohol from which the ester is formed? We can take a simple example. For example, we have one carbon alcohol which is methanol CH3OH and one carbon carboxylic acid which is HCOOH. When alcohol combines with carboxylic acid, condensation reaction takes place and H is removed from alcohol and OH is removed from carboxylic acid. So we have H2O that is removed and remaining parts combine together to form ester. So we can write H C double bond O this part, then we have oxygen, then we have CH3. The reactants taken was this one was one carbon alcohol so it is methanol. This one was one carbon carboxylic acid so it is methanoic acid. Now the ester formed from these two is methyl methanoate. Now we can see that the carbon atoms are same in the reactants and ester. Hydrogen atoms are reduced by 2 because H2O is being removed. Again one oxygen atom has been removed. So carbon atoms are same. Hydrogen atoms are fewer. Oxygen atoms is also fewer. C is the correct answer. Question 39. Polylactic acid is a polymer used to make biodegradable cups. The partial structure of polylactic acid is shown. This is the partial structure. We have ester linkage present in this polymer. Which statements apply to polylactic acid? Number 1. It is made by addition polymerization. Now this is incorrect because ester linkage is formed in condensation polymerization. Part 2, it is made by condensation polymerization. This is true statement. Carboxylic acid on one side and alcohol on the other side. They react together to form water and ester functional group. It is a polyester as we can see that more than one ester functional group is present so therefore this is true. 4. The monomer used to make it is ethene. Now the monomer is either carboxylic acid or alcohol. It is not ethene so this is wrong. As option 2 and 3 are correct, answer is therefore C.
Question 42. Large molecules P and Q both contain the same linkage. P occurs naturally but Q does not. Which row could be P and Q? In A, we have fat. Fat is natural. And then we have nylon. Nylon is synthetic. In part B, we have fat and terylene. Terylene is synthetic. In part C, we have nylon which is synthetic and protein which is natural. In part D, we have protein which is natural and terylene which is synthetic. In fat, we have ester linkage present which is C double bond O O. In nylon, we have amide linkage which is C double bond O and H. So it is not A because both does not have same linkage. Similarly, in part B, we can see that fats has ester linkage. Terylene also has ester linkage, so B is correct. In part C, we have nylon and protein. Both have the same linkage, amide linkage. But nylon is synthetic in nature. It is not natural, so therefore C is wrong. In part D, we have protein, which is natural. And it has amide linkage, while terylene does not have amide linkage, ester linkage is present in terylene. So D is also wrong. Correct option is B. Thanks for watching. A like, comment and subscribe will be highly appreciated. You can find related videos and playlists. Stay happy and enjoy learning.